and get right into the word. Is that good? Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. As for me and my house. How many of you know that the family was ordained and established even before the church? In the beginning of Genesis, God said it's not good for man to be alone. Amen? He established the family. Somebody say family. How many of you know family is a group of people that are gathered together, recognizing their need for each other? That's the reason why the church is called the family of God. How many of you know we're a family in the church? Somebody say, I don't have any family. If you belong to the church, you do. I don't have any family members. Yeah, if you belong to the church, you're, you're part of the family. Amen. How many of you know God established some things that we don't even recognize? Like how many of you know the Christians are a nation? We're our own nation. The Christian nation. Amen. God has established us to be a holy nation. A peculiar people. Amen. We're a family. We are the family. That's the reason why Paul talks often about the body being connected together and each member needing each other. We're a family. But I want to talk about the family that Joshua made this commitment and he was talking to Israel a lot of times we'll, we quote this, this scripture out of Joshua chapter 24 and verse 15 uh, we as for me and my house we will serve the Lord and I think that's probably one of the most well known scriptures maybe except for John 3.16 amen or the 23rd Psalm it's quoted about as much as any one scripture in the, in the Bible because it refers to family amen but I'd like you to look with me for a moment at, at Joshua uh, ch chapter 24, verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. I want us to see why Joshua said this, as for me and my house. I want to find out what was the criteria that pressed him to make this statement to Israel. He wasn't just talking to his own family. He was talking to Israel. And besides that, he gave him a choice. There were some things going on in the, in, in, in the uh, nation of Israel as Joshua was trying to bring them into, a, into awareness of God's anointing. They'd been through some things. Uh, they were drifting away. They was losing focus. And Joshua was trying to bring them back to a place of recognition of who God was. He said, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him. In sanctity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. How many of you can see that there were some things going on that probably wasn't proper? How many of you think that this is not was just this wasn't just a bold statement as for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord, uh, trying to set the example for everybody, but there were some things going on in the midst of of the, uh, of the Israelites uh, that were causing them to lose focus. Amen. He said, put away, put away the gods, that's small g, worshiping other gods, idolatry, which your fathers served on the other side. On the other side of what? On the other side of the Jordan, in the wilderness. How many of you with me? And in the wilderness, they found themselves getting caught up in some of the uh, things that the heathens were involved with and then uh, when Joshua brought Israel into Canaan land how many of you know uh, the, a lot of the cities uh, that they had to take over and they had to possess were heathen cities amen in fact Joshua mentions those uh, to the Israelites and he talks about uh, uh, the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and all those that were worshiping other gods and he's saying put aside that kind of stuff and if it seems evil to you, now you know a lot of times we think that we have a, uh, we want to get somebody saved, so we just keep on crowding them, we keep on howling them, we, we keep on grabbing them by the neck, get saved, get saved, get saved, because we, of course, want them to go to heaven. That's the reason why we do that. Amen? How many of you know Joshua didn't act that way? He gave him a choice. Bottom line, here's your choice. If it seems evil to you to serve God and serve the Lord, then today's the day of choice for you. This is a day of choice. This is a day that you can make a decision you're going to serve God or you're not. He said, uh, whether God, he said, uh, choose yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served uh, that were on the other side of the river 
or the gods of the Amorites in which the land that you dwell, you picked up that heathen worship since we've been in Canaan land. But as for me, but as for me, some, sometimes we have to make a decision and a point in our life uh, that we can't, uh, we can't force anybody to do anything. We can't change the world. Amen? When I got saved, I was so excited. I was so pumped. I was with somebody the other day that just got born again. They're a new Christian. And sometimes our zeal, our zeal for the things of God can almost be overbearing and push people away. Nobody here, of course, nobody here, but. And we get so excited and we bombard our family and we bombard the people at work. Man, I mean, we're cooking and booking. I got saved and you better get saved. And pretty soon, we, we don't have, nobody wants to listen to us because we've been so aggressive. I don't sense that with Joshua. He simply said this, choose today. Choose today who you're going to serve. You want to serve the heathens? <clears throat> you want to serve the gods of the Amorites? You want to serve uh, those false religions and false gods that was all ramp rampant through this land before uh, Joshua brought them into the Canaan land and divided the land up? But as for me... But as for me, I can't do anything about my neighbors. But as for me, I can't do anything about the people I work with except for be a good example and live in front of them. But as for me, amen, I can't make somebody else understand the principle of the kingdom that God he so loved the world that he gave his son just for them, that Jesus died for them, that there had been nobody else on the earth. And, and, and if they would make a decision to ask Jesus into their life, they would have a home in heaven that Jesus is preparing a mansion for them and they could spend eternity with him. I can't make them understand that. But as for me, but as for me and my house, how many of you know God holds the household authority as a priest of a home? And if you're a single person, you're the priest of your home. If you're a single mother raising children, you're the priest of your home. You've been placed in authority for that. And you're responsible for those that are under the covering of your home. But as for me and my house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's what Joshua was saying. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river over in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, if it seems evil, if you don't like it, if you think that's an evil thing, then choose for yourself this day whom you're going to serve. I love the stance that Joshua's making here. Amen? He's not trying to talk anybody into anything. He's not trying. Well, why isn't he? Why isn't he being a little more aggressive about drawing them in? You know why? Because they already know better. You only say it so many times. Uh, you only lay the rules down so many times. Only so many times can you say this is what's best for you. Amen? I went to, a, I went to my doctor one time, and, and, and he was going to prescribe something for me and, and I was trying to deal with this thing <clears throat> myself and work it out and he said the truth of the matter is he said you need medication to get, to, uh, to get yourself balanced out and I says doc I just don't think that I want to take that medication I've been, I, I, tell me something else I can do to keep this thing on balance you know what he said he said if you don't want to listen to me then you just deal with what the circumstances are he didn't get mad about it he didn't say, you better take that. You better do it. He says, listen, if that's your choice, you made the choice. You do what you want to do. I'm going to give you the prescription if you want to take it. It's obviously going to be better for you, but if you think you can work it out, that's your choice. I mean, is, I mean that's fair enough, isn't it? Needless to say, I took the medication. <laughs> you know, choose this day. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. Whether it's God, which your father served, and that we're on this side of the river, or you're going to serve the God of the Amorites, uh, which is in this land that you dwell. But as for me, I'm going to serve the Lord. Oh, I tell you, that's just awesome, I think. Whatever else might be said about the family or the home, it's the bottom line of life. Anybody get that? Whatever else anybody wants to say about the family, 
Whatever anybody wants to build up about the home and the family, there's all kinds of things said about family, good, bad, and ugly. But let me tell you about the family. It's the bottom line to life, the anvil upon which attitudes and convictions are hammered out is in the family. Anybody hear that? It's a place where life's bills come to. It's the single most force in our earthly existence that pulls us together and establishes godly principles, the family. I'm sure you've heard it said that home is where life makes up its mind. Sometimes parents forget how powerful or seemingly small actions can be. How important how we act in our home. Where you have children in your home, they're watching you. I said they're watching you. You can, uh, how we act and what we say speaks louder. In fact, our actions speak louder than our words. Someone shared this with me, and I'm going to share it with, me, with you. It's called, When You Thought I Wasn't Looking. Number one, when you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you hang up my first painting on the refrigerator, and I wanted to paint another one. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you feed a stray cat, and I thought it was good to be kind to animals. When I thought you wasn't looking, I saw you make my favorite cake for me, and I, lo I knew that little things were special. When you thought I wasn't looking, I heard you say a prayer, and I believed that there is a God, and I could always talk to him. When I thought you wasn't looking, I felt you kiss me goodnight, and I felt your love. When I thought you wasn't looking, I saw tears come from your eyes, and I learned that sometimes things hurt, but it's all right to cry. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw that you cared, and I wanted to be everything that I could be because you care for me. When you thought I wasn't looking, I looked, and I wanted to say things for all the things I saw when you thought I wasn't looking. Oh, listen, our kids are looking. Our children are watching. We're examples, amen? And it's time for the family to come together. I appreciate that, uh, that card that you made up, sweetheart, because that's, those are the principles of family. Those are the principles of coming together. Last week, I traveled 6,000 miles with my young sister, my younger sister, and I met my older sister in Olympia, Washington. And we met to remind each other that we need each other. Hadn't seen my sister Patty for many years, and it was time for me to meet with her, not to gather with the family to eat a lot, even though we did that. Not to have all her children and grandchildren come and, and hug us and say, it was good to see us, hey, good to see you, Uncle George, that's okay, and we did that. But let me tell you what the most important thing uh, that we did. We gathered together, and most of the time we spent sharing about what great influence our mom and our dad had on our life. Here's three siblings sitting together, and we're all, uh, we're all old enough to be grandparents. And we're talking about uh, the things that mom and dad did. How, how my sister and I remember as little kids coming home from school, walking two miles from a little one-room country school. We lived out in the country, and uh, the little one-room country school that had a pot belly stove in the middle and two outhouses outside. The first row was first grade, second row was second grade through the sixth grade. One teacher would walk home in the wintertime in the snow and, and get home. And when we would come home, the first thing we would do is find mom reading her Bible and praying for us. We talked about those kind of examples. That's what family's all about. One day while listening to the radio, I, had, I heard a news report about a new study on teenage drinking. They was doing some research. The researchers discovered that parents are the strongest influence on whether or not their children will use alcohol. These parents say, well, don't do as I, as I say do, or don't do as I do, do as I say do. 
We tell our children not to drink, but we got alcohol in the refrigerator. We got beer and we got uh, we got whiskey on the and, and 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 wine on the shelf, but we tell our kids it's not good. Don't don't do that. Where the home is strong and stable, children are much less likely to drink. The result should should surprise us, shouldn't surprise us, but they do. It's only because we overlook the power that parents have for good and for evil in the lives of their children. Parents, let me say this to you. Everything we do, we're setting examples to somebody. Bring up your children the way they should go. When they grow older, they won't depart from it. Joshua certainly understood the power of parenting. As he came to the end, close to the end of his life, and he called the leaders of Israel together for a final message. And I believe that this was the end of the book of Joshua. It was the final message that he was preparing for them. He sounded the call of renewal that began to remind uh, the people of God's blessings. You know, we need to be reminded of what God does. Remind your children how God blessed you and your, and your parents and, and grandparents. Remind your children how many times prayer brought you through. Remind your children that it was times that there, that there wasn't any way, but God intervened and he brought the answer. Yeah. Hallelujah. I like what it says in, in Joshua 24. And if you go from front, I'm not going to take time to read 1 through 13 because it's an incredible encounter. But Joshua starts to explain to Israel all the things that God had done for them. He said, don't you remember that God took care of you in the wilderness and, and, and fed you manna from heaven? Don't you remember that God brought you out to the place of bondage? Don't you remember uh, that when the, uh, when the Egyptians were chasing you, God put a fire, pillar of fire to protect you? And don't you remember God opened up the Red Sea and we walked across dry shot? Don't you remember that God was a God of provision? And Joshua goes and explains all this to them. And then he says in verse 13, and he's given you the land for which you did not labor. Talking about where they was at at the present time in Canaan land. And you dwelt in them and you ate that from the vineyards and you, and you enjoyed the olive groves and you enjoyed the plants that grew and he gave you houses that you didn't build and he gave you vineyards you didn't plant. Don't you know God is a God of provision? And he was telling Israel not to forget because they must have forgot. Because now they're worshiping other gods. They must have forgot about the Jehovah God that was able to meet their need in the midst of their trouble. They must have forgot uh, that God is Jehovah Jireh, their need meter, and he's the one that cared and loved them in all circumstances. And they was in the wilderness for 40 years and their clothes never wore out and their shoes never wore out. And he provided water for 600,000 Israelites and food every day. A God of provision. We need to remind each other that God is the God of, of our families and God has brought us through. And remember, that sometimes maybe it's a good idea to journal some things and write down some of the extraordinary things that God has done in our life so we can say to our children, let me, let me show you. It was interesting as I, my sister and I were at her little one-room apartment and, and she brought a little book out that, that she got after my mom had passed and, and, it, and it, was a, it was a book about a booklet about this thick was her journal. And one, uh, one scripture and one story after the other how God had provided. How, how our circumstances were not good and how our life wasn't easy back in the 50s and the 60s and, and, and raising five children on a, on, on a shoestring and in the middle of many times circumstances were not favorable and she gave testimony how God provided through all those times. And I was able to sit down and we wept as we read those journals and as we read her love for God and how her love for her family and her family was number one in her life. Hallelujah. Now Joshua challenges the people to be faithful to God in the midst of the message that he stirs the word of God within them and he tells them don't forget. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In those words, in those verses leading up to that, he explains to them how good God is. And then he says if you want to continue to live in the world, 
If you want to continue to bring your family up with all the worldliness around it and, and eventually lose the emphasis on your children because the doors were open for all the ungodly things to come in and we didn't stop it. Choose this day. Choose this day with the unit of the Lord. I find some things in these incredible scriptures I want to uh, share with you for the next few moments uh, that I think are, uh, are vitally important in regards to decision. Somebody say decision. When he said choose this day, what he was saying is make a decision today. Choose this day. Make a decision on some, uh, on some incredible uh, principles uh, that will cause us to choose right. How many of you know there's a lot of people today that aren't making good decisions? A lot of family members uh, that are, are raising their children, they, the children are running the household. The children's telling mom and dad what they're going to do. Uh, the children are, 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 are turning around and getting right in the face of their parents with lack of respect. And we wonder why there's a breakdown in the family. Let me tell you, the family has to be established on the principles of God and on honor and on respect. Thank you for those amens. I'm going to give you some things I believe Joshua was building this, uh, this dialogue on. I believe he was building something when he started in Joshua uh, 24, chapter 1, and sharing uh, with these people that were starting to lose grip on their relationship with God. He was trying to bring them back. He was trying to bring them back to a place of reality. He was trying to bring them back to God. I believe decision number one, listen. If we're going to have families that's going to be godly families and we're going to see our children turn out to be the way we feel like they need to be, we need to build a grace-based family. I said a grace base. There's some times you're just going to have to move in grace. There's just times that we're going to have to recognize the grace that was given to me. And if it was given to me, my God, I've got to give grace to my family members. There's going to be conflicts and there's going to be situations that we're not going to like, but we need to build on the grace of God. As Joshua recounts the, the, uh, the story and the conquest of the people coming into promised land, listen, he quotes the Lord who has a strong reminder of his people. It's interesting if you look in, in Joshua 24 and verse 2, and Joshua said to the people, thus says the Lord God of Israel. How many of you know that puts a different emphasis on thus says Joshua? In other words, he is quoting, he's reminding them of what the Lord says. Amen? He said, when you crossed the Jordan and you came to Jericho, the citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also uh, the Amorites and the, and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the, uh, and the Gergesites and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, he said, but I gave them into your hand. That's what God said. God said, the enemy came up against you, but I put them in your hand. When you went into Canaan land, you had to go take the land, but I gave you the victory to take it. You just didn't walk in there and everything's ready to go and there wasn't any conflict. Now listen, our Christian life is going to have conflict. Now, there's going to be times as we move through with the anointing of God that we're going to have to have the whole armor of God on and we're going to have to do the work of the Lord and we're going to have to defend our, our, our position in God even though we recognize that God's the one that does the battle for us. Can I hear an amen? amen. He said, I sent the hornets ahead of you which drove out the enemy also drove out the Amorite kings when they came against you. And he starts telling them all the things that he did. God has given them grace and letting them know, it was my grace that brought you through. It was my love that brought you through. All, all the whole time my hand was upon you. I was watching over you because you're mine. And I believe God watches over us today. You did not do with your own sword and your own bow, he said. You didn't you defend yourself. You didn't uh, cause the battles to be won. You're, it wasn't by your great strength, but my hand was upon you. Hallelujah, we have to remember the hand of the Lord. Joshua wants the people never to forget 
that it's, it was the Lord that brought them through. And church, listen, I believe we need to remind ourselves and we need to remind our family it's always God that brings us through. It's God that brought you through those critical times with your children. It's God that provided that job at the very last moment when it seemed like all hope was gone and there wasn't any finances left. It was God that intervened at the time when you got the bad report from the doctor and you said, this is the big one, honey. I'm not sure about this one this time. The doctor said it's not good. And God intervened and healed and moved on your behalf and set you free and let the power of God reign in your life that you can be a witness. We got to remember. We ought to do with our families what Joshua did with the people of Israel. It's a good thing to review past blessings. It's a good thing to be reminded of God's grace in our life. It's a good thing to tell our children that God still is on the throne and his grace is sufficient. And our children go to school and they got to face a test that maybe they didn't study like they should or <clears throat> maybe they have a hard time catching it and, and getting it no matter how hard they study. It's still a tough thing. Instead of, instead of saying, study more and go on your own. Well, I'll say, listen, have you prayed about it? Do you know God will see you through? Do you know God will be in the classroom with you? Do you know God will give you favor if you just believe him because he's a God of grace? Teach our children to rely on him. Amen? We've got to think about those things and the things that God did as we remember God's grace. I like what it says in Psalms 145. If you want to turn there with me for a minute, Psalms 145. Verses 4, 5, and 6. Before I read it, I'm going to ask you the question, has God blessed you? Then write it down. Has God blessed you? Then think about it often. I ask you, has God blessed you? Then tell it to your children and your family and your friends. Has God blessed you? Then pass it on to succeed the next generation. Because that's what it says in Psalms 145, verse 4. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty. Oh, how I'm going to read that again. I mean, that's just majestic right there. I mean, that just has, that has a majestic flow. Can anybody feel it? There's a, there's a majestic flow to it. Come on. Uh, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty. That's poetic, isn't it? Any of you, any of you that are in the arts, any of you that like music, any of you that are a little artsy, something will hit you in there, you, you know. I'm going to read it again. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty. I want to say it again, but I won't. And on your wondrous works. Is anybody with me? Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts. And I will declare your greatness. You know what that's saying? That's saying that we need to tell our children how great God is. We need to show our next generation that God is a God of more than enough. Our, our, our children and our grandchildren, we still got great responsibilities to proclaim his word. Another way to build grace is based, <clears throat> basing on the family is to practice gracious giving. Teach our children to give. Teach our children uh, that, uh, that giving is the key uh, to honoring God and showing God our love for him because he first loved us. Can I hear an amen? amen? When we give liberally, we teach our children to do the same. They learn that we give because we have received and that God never stops giving to his children. Suffer not the little children to come unto me for such is the kingdom, Jesus said. Teach our children and our family. And then finally, to build grace-based family by being quick to forgive. Being quick to forgive offenses. By being quick to say, I'm sorry. By being quick to say, uh, even though it's, it seems like we haven't been getting along too good, uh, let's, uh, maybe there was a misunderstanding. and Maybe I didn't handle it right and you didn't handle it right. Uh, but let's clear the slate and start again. Because... We're family. 
Then the next thing I think that, that, that Joshua did as far as decisions, he, his second decision is teaching my family to worship God. Joshua 24, let's go back to Joshua real quickly. We need to be worshipers. I said we need to be worshipers. Joshua 24, 14, now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Be a worshiper. Be a worshiper. Fearing the Lord means having such a deep respect for God that we want to please him in everything that we do. Is there something inside of us that says, uh, says, whatever I do, I want to please God. Whatever I do, God is just pleasing to you. So many times people, uh, so many times uh, new Christians will come and say, uh, and they'll say, uh, Pastor, uh, do you think it's okay if I do this or if I do that? Do you think it's okay if, if I start a business and, and, and I can make a lot of money uh, with, a, uh, with somebody? They're not Christians, but I want to, uh, well, we're going to go in business together. You think it's okay? You know what I tell people some questions that they, they answer? Go get on your knees and, and start talking to God about it and pray. And if you feel good about it, after you're done praying, uh, then, you're gonna, then probably God's going to give you a green light. Are you with me? You see, whenever we fear the Lord, we're going to want to do things that pleases him. And search the scriptures out and see what it says about that given thing. If the scripture says don't be equally yoked with an unbeliever, then don't go into business with somebody that doesn't know God because you're preparing for a train wreck. Can I hear an amen? amen. Or marry somebody, get involved in a relationship, you're going to marry somebody and you fall in love with him and in love with her, but the only thing is they're, they don't believe, they're not a Christian, they don't believe in Jesus. Oh, I'll change them after I marry them. No, you won't. Oh, we'll change, I'll change them. I've heard that so many times. If you think that's going to happen, forget it. We make big mistakes sometimes because uh, we, will, we won't stop and say, what does God want me to do? Essentially, I believe that what our family is teaching is, easy, is, is, is better caught than taught. Your family learns by watching you and by seeing how you act and seeing what you do. And we ought to be an example to our family members uh, that God is truly operating in our life. When the parents truly fear God and their children, uh, we'll learn to fear him too. When they love the Lord, it'll be a natural thing for the children to learn to love the Lord. If you don't believe it, watch these little children. I'm I wish you could all come sometime and, and walk and come in here when all of our children are at the school or, or in here having their, uh, their assembly and they're praising God and they come up on the platform they're excited about the Lord. And I'll tell you, when these little kids start to learn about God when they're little, it'll stay in them. Amen. And it'll make a difference. And some of them don't have the Christian environment at home that we would like to see them have. But praise God for our teachers and praise God for our school and praise God for a Christian school that has Christian principles and raise up these children in the way that they should go. And many of them go home and change their parents. Hallelujah. God bless you all that are, right in the, that are keeping that school going and making it happen. And I appreciate it. I believe that men bear the heavy responsibility. Now listen to me a minute. I believe that the men bear the heavy responsibility in this area. I'm speaking of dads, husbands, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, and uncles. I'm also speaking to the young men, high school boys, college men, young single men, and older single men, men in every age. It starts with us. It starts with our attitude. It starts with the way we handle and do things. We, too many years, have laid the burden on the women that God never intended them to have that burden alone. God meant spiritual leadership to be shared in the, sharing in the burden of raising children and being the spiritual leaders and taking our families to church and, and praying in the home and bringing the word of God and having Bible study. It has to be done. It should start with the men in the household. 
There wouldn't be near as many homes broken up and divorces today if men would start in the beginning by establishing godly principles in the home and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There was a picture that someone uh, drew that was a, a picture of a family going to church. And here was the picture. The picture was uh, the mother and, 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 and her uh, five little children behind her all dressed up ready for church. And all the little children uh, was behind and four of them, were, there was five of them, four of them were girls. They were dressed up and one of them was a young boy. And as they, the picture showed them going off, walking out of the house, going off to church, the mother was all dressed up, the four girls was all dressed up, and the, the young boy was lagging behind with a disgusted look on his face. And as they started to go off to the, uh, 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 off to the side was another little picture of dad sitting in the living room with his pajamas on, a cigarette in his hand, waving goodbye to his family as they go to church. The son wanted to be with the dad. The son wanted to be with dad. Dad wasn't going to church, but the son wanted to be with dad because he honored his dad and he respected his dad. And so he, he wanted to be like his dad. He was in rebellion about going to church. Listen, listen, dads. Listen, fathers, grandfathers, it's our responsibility to set the example and set the pace so our sons and daughters will know God, not because they have to, but because we've ingrained in them the presence of the Lord because we love the Lord. Amen. And in closing, listen, decision number three, and I don't have time to get into these, but decision number three, Joshua said, serve him with all your faithfulness, throw away the gods of your forefathers, worshiping beyond the river of Egypt, and serve the Lord. Listen, become a student of obedience. Become a student of obedience. Let obedience make the difference in your life. Be obedient to the things of God. Don't be in rebellion to it. Be, be in obedience to the word of God. Be in, in obedience to the things that God tells us to do and we'll find out his blessings will flow and you'll walk in his favor and God's anointing. Is anybody with me? I got a couple more things that I feel like that God has shown me and we'll look at those tonight. Did anybody get anything out of this this morning? Listen. As for me and my house, would somebody say that with me? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to serve God. This is the year of the family. This is the year that we're going to make our family stronger than ever. And this is the year that I would like to see Faith Outreach Center come to the top with families that are bonded, that are connected. The children are coming to church. Dads and moms are bringing the children to church. And those of you, listen, there's, there, there's those in this church right here because of circumstances and situations out of their own control, they're now raising children themselves. Most of the time, that burden, burden falls on, the, on mom. And she's taking care of working a full-time job, trying to pay the bills, trying to keep the household running, loving her children and making sure that they have all the things that they need, everything from, uh, from uh, groceries and food on the table to clothes to come to school. And I just want to say how much I honor you. I honor you single mothers that are doing the job the best you can. I applaud you this morning. Sometimes we think because Joshua was a man and he made the statement, as for me and my house, that applies to every, every person that's got a household, especially you single moms that are doing the best with your children. The anointing of God flows through you too. And continue to hang in there. Continue to walk with God. Don't compromise on your convictions. Don't compromise on what you believe. And you'll see at the end of the day, the anointing of God's going to continue to flow. And your children will serve God. And their children will serve God. And you'll be honored because you did the right thing. Amen.
Every head bowed and every eye closed just for a moment. Maybe you're here this morning. Listen, serious issue with me. I want our families to bond together and be strong. Tonight, come. Please come tonight. Let's fill this place up tonight and make this declaration, make this pledge that we will serve God in our families. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your own personal Savior. Maybe you've never asked him to come into your heart. Pastor, how do I know that I'm saved? By answering this question, if you would die tonight, God forbid, but if you would. Do you know that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Do you know that Jesus prepared a home for you? Well, nobody can know that. Yes, they can. Jesus said, these things I've written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life. No. Be positive. If you don't know Jesus, would you please, would you please, I implore you, allow this pastor to pray with you and lead you to Jesus and bring you into the kingdom. Maybe you used to serve God. Maybe you was one of the leaders of the church. Maybe there was a time uh, that any time something was going on, you was there. But you got offended. You got wounded. Maybe a family issue. Maybe a church issue. Who knows? But you stepped away from that position, and now you don't feel God in your life like you used to. And he's saying, my son, my daughter, come home. Young person, come home. Come back to the place where I can use you. If that's you, this pastor would like to pr pr pray with you to bring you back to the Lord. Is there anybody meets either one of these categories? Would you raise your hand and say, that's me, Pastor, pray for me. I need that prayer. Raise your hand if that's you. You're not sure about your salvation or you're not sure about your relationship and where you stand with God. He wants you to come home today. Is there one? <coughs> stand with me if you would, everybody in the house. Would my elders come to the altar, please? As for me and my house, we we're going to serve the Lord. Maybe there's a family member here that's burdened about your husband, burdened about somebody that's disappointed you and hurt you. Instead of putting them down and being mad about it, why don't you come and pray for them? Why don't you come and ask God to do a work in their heart? Maybe you need a healing this morning. Come and receive the healing. Let God heal you. Maybe you're facing some issues that you know that's bigger than you are. Would you come? We will serve the Lord as for me and my house. We will serve.
we will serve. Serve the Lord. Sing it one more time, everybody. As for me and my house, we will serve. so much ministry going on. Let's sing it again. This is God's time to move. I want every believer, every child of God to believe that God is, is, is still in control to reach out towards these people and pray. I want some prayer power. Connect with me. Connect. Reach out and pray. Come on. Let's pull down the stronghold of the devil. prayer language, pray in the Holy Ghost, pray in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. platform together as the body of Christ as families as families that are committed as for me and my house we'll serve the Lord and let's make a commitment let's take the pledge what is a pledge a pledge is to say some things verbally that we are determined that we shall do let's take the pledge and every single person that comes tonight to take the pledge as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. You'll get a certificate that you can put on the wall, put it in a frame, that you took the pledge that this year, 2013, is the year of the family, and you're committed to your family like never before. Can I hear an amen? amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise, somebody. Esmond, come up. Esmond, come up, lead us in, dismiss us in prayer, if you will. You've been awesome this morning. You've been an incredible congregation this morning. Receiving the word of God, I've watched you. I've watched you receive. I love you. Mickey and I thank you. And we're so blessed and so honored that together we make up the family of God here at Faith Outreach Center. Praise God. Just a word of encouragement. If you believe that you are alone in the family, that maybe your spouse is not standing with you. Don't be discouraged, but be the light and come this evening because you are standing in the gap for your family. And you know what? God is faithful. God is faithful and he will hear and he will answer your prayers because it is God's desire that you and your household be saved. Amen. So we're going to agree today that God is going to move in the families. Don't think you're alone because one with God is a majority 
And if God is on your side, you got the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we can stand together in faith, believing that you are faithful to your word, O oh God. We thank you, God, that the family is dear to your heart. And it is your desire, O oh God, that we and our households be saved. We thank you, God, that you have a covenant agreement with us to bring salvation to our households. And we know, oh God, that we can turn to you because you are faithful and true to your word. And now, Lord, as we leave this place today, we thank you, God, for the blessings of your protection. We thank you, God, that you will watch over us as we leave this place. We thank you for the angels who you assigned to watch over us and guard us in all of our ways. And we look forward to the next occasion when we could come together, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth, to believe, oh God, that our families, our families shall be a living example, a testimony, oh God, to your righteousness, to your truth, and to your love. And we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.